Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alice Lee. And uh, yes, you heard right. It's Harvard Innovation Labs. We are now plural. And that's because uh, in addition to the Harvard iLab, where you're, you find yourself sitting right now, we, which serves current Harvard students to um, explore entrepreneurship and innovation at various stages, we've grown this ecosystem to include the Launch Lab. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Launch Lab, it is located directly across the street from us and is meant to support uh, alumni founded ventures and we're going to continue to grow and many of you have already been talking to Neil and uh, have seen our beautiful uh, foam core board of the next uh, initiative at here at the Harvard Innovation Labs which is the Harvard Life Lab and you'll hear a little bit more about it later. Um, but I'm the assistant director that oversees all things health and sciences, so you could understand why I'm super excited about the Life Lab, but also you can understand why I'm really excited about tonight's event with Stefan Boncel, who is the CEO of Moderna Therapeutics. Um, you will shortly hear from uh, about Stefan's personal and professional journey in his conversation with Jody, Jody Goldstein, who is our managing director. Uh, but I wanted to first tell you a little bit about Moderna and why it's one of the most exciting life sciences companies, um, not only in Boston, but in the world. So Moderna was founded in 2011 by a list of or a few heavy hitters in both scientific, the scientific realm and in industry. Um, but shortly after, Stefan joined the team and uh, as the president and CEO. And he kind of, he kept it in stealth mode for two years with a small team to validate the science. And when I say stealth mode, like so stealth, there was no website for two years, right? Um, and since, but since Stefan has stepped up to the helm of Moderna, uh, he's raised more than 1.2 billion, and yes, billion, with a B, uh, dollars in venture funding, and then also large development deals with AstraZeneca, Alexion, and Merck. Um, the Moderna team has also grown, and not only in terms of employees. I actually didn't know. I wrote 250. It's actually up to 450, um, but they're still hiring. So if you want a job, you, you know who to talk to later on. But organizationally, Moderna has also grown. Um, Similar to the iLab, where we have now a suite of offerings, uh, Moderna has four spin-out ventures, and all of these ventures, each of them address a different disease state uh, with the same kind of MR mRNA therapy um, uh, technology. Uh, but Moderna has continued to make a splash since 2000. It's only been a few years. It's about the same age as um, the iLab. But in 2015, it was listed as the number one disruptor in CNBC's list of disruptors. And it dethroned, of all things, SpaceX. So, I mean, if you're dethroning Elon Musk, like, you're a pretty big deal. Um, and in 2016, Moderna uh, is shifting gears and really concentrating on uh, taking a number of their clinic, uh, sorry, their candidates into clinical trials. And so a lot of, for a long time, it, Moderna was in stealth and all the scientific community and the uh, startup community is like, what are they doing? So now you know they're, they're bringing candidates to, uh, to clinical trials. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm a scientist, so I can't help myself but to make sure that everyone in the audience has a little bit of an idea of what um, Moderna is doing in terms of science and kind of, or what even mRNA or messenger RNA therapeutics means. So I'll start with DNA. So I, hopefully everyone in the room knows what DNA is. But mRNA is basically a copy of your DNA, which your cells or your body uses to produce proteins, which are basically essential for every bodily function. And sometimes in disease states, you either are missing a protein, there's too much, too little, it's a faulty protein. And so what do you do? Usually you would take a drug. So this drug is created outside of your body and then you take it and it helps with whatever disease. And that's if a drug is even exists. So what Moderna is doing is designing and creating these mRNAs that can be injected into your body. And then essentially your body is making the drug for you. And that sounds crazy, right? But I mean, they spent a lot of time and money validating the science, so it's really exciting um, to kind of see that possibility kind of come to fruition. So it's a very simplified explanation why I just gave you, but hopefully it gives you the gist of it and uh, underscores how cool this stuff is. Moderna has a very ambitious mission. They're trying to get a lot of drugs into uh, the can a lot of candidates into the drug pipeline. 
And I think what I found most intriguing about Moderna is not only the, this grand mission, but how they've complemented the bio, uh, biological breakthroughs done in the lab with a really modern approach, I guess, taking, um, combining it with a robust uh, digital and uh, automation technology platform. And they've invested heavily in that, and Stefan might talk about it a little bit later. But I think the technology platform, I can't do it justice, I'm a scientist. So I think there's a video that Moderna has produced that you know, will demonstrate kind of what they're doing in the technology side. Moderna's modified messenger RNA creates therapeutic proteins and, like software, contains instructions which direct cellular ribosomal machinery. The Drug Design Studio accelerates the drug development process by enabling scientists to design, optimize, and order mRNA therapeutics in minutes for delivery in weeks through an encrypted web portal and secure private cloud. A scientist can select any protein in the human proteome, design novel proteins like antibodies, traps, or fusion proteins, or explore previously undruggable pathways. Users can design the mRNA to tune protein expression, target specific tissues, and optimize mRNA properties. The studio integrates with Moderna's automation platforms, directing orders through each phase of mRNA synthesis. Once the order is placed, the scientist will receive the mRNA drug in just weeks. The Drug Design Studio is the front end to Moderna's highly scalable, fully automated, high-throughput mRNA production facility, allowing users to design and begin production of one or dozens of constructs in a matter of minutes. So I was really glad to have the video so I wouldn't have to try and explain all the cool things that they're doing. But I'm sure with that, you guys have a lot of questions. And tonight, we're going to try and streamline the Q&A a little bit. If you guys tweet, please tweet your questions, and then we'll read those out um, during the Q&A. But um, if you don't, we will also have a mic later on, because I realize a lot of scientists don't tweet. I didn't get a Twitter account until like two years ago. So now, on to the main attraction. Um, I'd like to welcome on stage uh, Jody Goldstein, the Managing Director of the Harvard Innovation Labs, and Stefan Bansell, who is the CEO of Moderna Therapeutics. So please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Oh, no. Ladies first. All right. Thank you, guys. Oh, oh wait. Let me turn my thing on. I get yelled at. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes? Yes? Thank you all so much for being here um, on this rainy night, and especially a thank you to thank Stefan you. for uh, making the journey over here in this horrible weather. Um, we are super excited to have you here tonight, and um, I can't wait to uh, talk with you about your journey. Um, so this Other Side series that we are doing is really an attempt to get to that other side. Um, you know, the, the meaningful insights and unconventional career paths that we'll hear about and the unique experiences that different entrepreneurs have on their journey to success. And we hope that it inspires all of you to pursue um, your own unconventional journey. Um, and uh, I do want to mention, Alice mentioned our, our next adventure that we're going on uh, with the iLab, with the launch of the Life Lab this uh, coming fall. Um, if yeah. anyone wants to hear a little bit more about that, we're happy to talk to you after the program. I must admit, I am not a scientist, unlike Alice. Um, and so all of this is, is uh, I'm getting up a very steep learning curve, and uh, it's especially timely because uh, we will soon have many life science ventures moving into the Life Lab very soon. Uh, so we're super excited to continue to resource our entrepreneurs in a meaningful way. And uh, as you probably know from experience, having the ability to replicate your experiments early on in uh, your the stages of development uh, gives you uh, straighter line to access to capital, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and so we want to help catalyze the, um, the development of life science ventures. So enough said about that. Um, really interested in talking to Stefan about his journey. So let's jump on into it. Um, the video was a great start. Um, but let's talk a little bit about Moderna. Um, you know, from your perspective, uh, you took over in 2011. How has the company evolved? Where is it headed? Wow. And whatever else you'd like to say. Sure. So uh, I joined the company when it was just being started. Uh, as you said, you know, a few you know, well-known people like you know, Langer and Nuba at Flagship were putting the, the idea of the company together. And so I joined Flagship, there was nothing. So I you know, started in an office. There was just an idea. 
and that was Moderna in 2011. And so the first few months were kind of hectic because I have never been in discovery in my life. You know, I've been in big pharma, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But I've been more a commercial guy, manufacturing guy, a bit of development, but never done discovery. And if you think about Moderna in the, in a few early days, it was discovery. Actually, until last December, when we entered the clinic, it was a discovery company. And so it was a bit scary. And even, you know, I remember telling Nuba, I said, you know, I've never done discovery. <laughs> So de facto, I'm the chief scientific officer of Moderna. And that is really scary. Um, and he kind of agreed with me. Um, and so the, the, the first challenge was, where do you start? Because what was very clear to all of us as we are putting the company together was, if this is going to work for one drug, because you, know, you have messenger RNA in every one of your cells making trillions of protein every day, it was going to work for two or three or dozens and dozens of medicines. So the question is, where do you start? You know, do you try to pick something and rush it to the clinic to show this is working in humans? Because, of course, the first big question, the first biggest risk was, you know, is it going to work in humans? Are you going to have you know, people dying? A bit like you know, when there was a first gene therapy trial in the 90s, you know, first clinical trial, and an 18-year-old kid died mm -hmm. at the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And for 10 years, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really trying to figure out things. So that was really Moderna, like most probably like a lot of those you know, companies that are incubating here, <laughs> where people are trying to figure out what do they do. Uh, that was Moderna back then. So if you fast forward now, I mean, as you heard, I mean, we have 450 people in the company. Uh, we still have $860 million of cash. Um, and uh, uh, it was a big celebration for us at Christmas because we entered the clinic. I'm happy to report now we have 100 uh, subjects that have been dosed. They're all doing great. Um, <laughs> and we're starting to see actually data coming out from the, the clinic that are extremely encouraging about actually not only the safety, but also the efficacy of the drugs. Uh, so that's a bit where we are now. Amazing. What an incredible journey just this far, and there's so much more to go. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's go all the way back to the start. Um, I, I'm always fascinated by an entrepreneur's journey and how, you know, we, we talked a little bit about how everything you've done in the past has perfectly um, defined what, what you're doing now, but it, I'm sure it hasn't always um, uh, been completely intentional. Uh, was your journey more organic? Did you, was it very intentional? Did you have a, a set path that you wanted to go on? And, and you're obviously from France, so maybe kind of talk about the beginning and, and what informed how you, how you became who you are today? So how early do you want to go? <laughs> uh, but Did I, you do science experiments when you were a child? Actually, no. <laughs> uh, actually, it's interesting. What really got me into the tech world uh, was coding, mm. which is, you know, I got my first computer at Christmas. I must have been, I don't know, 10 or 11. Uh -huh. And I started coding in, ba in basic, uh, <laughs> and then in C and Pascal and so on. And so I really got into technology through computers. And one of the books that really impressed me a lot was there was a Steve Jobs biography. Uh, I'm going to age myself now. Uh, <laughs> back in the, I would say, early 90s about his first life at Apple, you know, before he got fired right, of the company. Right. And the whole idea that you could you know, use computers to start businesses, uh, literally from a garage with nothing, uh, was extremely, extremely exciting. And so uh, I was more angled toward technology. And the... Um, the, the piece is quite funny because I'm in biology, and if you look at my career, I spent all my career in, the, in biology. Mm. I used to hate biology. Ah. Uh, and my, my mom is an MD, and I used to come back, and I was I, having like, you know, Ds and Cs in biology, so my mom not so happy. So there's uh, still hope for my children. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing that's very funny um, is I, I came back to biology through you know, chemistry. I used to love you know, science and chemistry, and then biochemistry, and then genetics. And I came back to biology through, through the, the chemistry route. Mm. Um, and then I just loved you know, biology and what you can do for patients, for humans, uh, using technology. And so I kind of took the route to, to go that way right after college. Mm. And what about your journey to CEO? Uh, when did you know you wanted to become a CEO? And, and were there steps early on in your mm. career that? So I think the CEO thing was actually quite early. Hmm. And I don't really know, so I cannot explain to you in a logical way how it happened. Uh, but the whole idea to make things happen, 
to combine things from your know, technology, commercial, manufacturing, and to make it work as a whole, so it made mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. and it was integrated. That just that whole concept was always very seducing to me. Mm. So I always have kind of my eyes on how do I get there. And so if you look at a lot of decisions I made for my career, it was not to get a promotion for the next job, but it was really for this 20 year down the road goal, which is, you know, I was, I'm a very pragmatic guy. So I was always thinking, you know, one day somebody will have to make a decision about me getting a CEO job. And most probably it's gonna be a group of people, you know, I hear board. Uh, and most probably you're gonna have a lot of candidates they can choose from because the world is a competitive place and there's a lot of smart people out there. And how do I make sure I'm not the bright maid? You know, how I make sure that I'm not always the, you know, the person that is almost selected, but doesn't get the role. And so the thing that uh, I thought at the time was gonna be important was I wanted a global experience uh, because clearly the world was becoming, again, I'm aging myself, you know, in the 90s, but the world was really, you know, becoming a, a, a very global place. And so I'm like, okay, I'm European. How do I get experience in Asia? Mm. Why Asia? Because most of the guys in Europe were coming to the US. So I'm like, I don't want to do like everybody else. I want to do something that, again, is going to differentiate mm -hmm. me. So mm -hmm. I went to work in Japan for four years. Um, now doing the business school in the US, I didn't even apply to a business school in Europe. Mm. Again, being European, what's the point of going to INSEAD or London Business School? I mean, those are great schools, but I'm like, for me as a, as a, as a European, it makes no mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So I've always tried to think about what do I do that's different? You know, same thing, I left HBS. I could have gone back to a commercial job, which is what I did before business school. And I said, no, I want to keep learning. Mm -hmm. And so I went to manufacturing. And at the time, everybody here on campus, I mean, HBS, I think it's right behind here, uh, thought I was nuts because, again, context is important. You know, I graduated in 2000. So for those of you that are old enough, I remember in March 2000, the NASDAQ, you know, peaked before going down pretty deep. But if you think about what was the first year, you know, of school in 99, and the first, you know, the term of the second year, you know, in, in so you have a back end of 99, and it was crazy. People were dropping out of class to join startups. And some of them made a lot of money because the company got bought two or three months after they dropped out of school and they get, you know, cashed out. So I have a couple of friends who made literally two or three million dollars by working three months in the company. Right. And everybody else is in class, like, oh shit, why did I stay in class? <laughs> and so. Then they were happy they did. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, but a few people really made real cash, not cash on paper in option, just cash. Uh -huh. uh, and so, because everybody was going to dot com and so on, and I was really um, clear I wanted to stay in life science. Because again, I think the chance to be able to impact so many people's life was very exciting mm -hmm. to me. And, um, and so I'm like, I could go commercial, I got a great job at Medtronic and Pfizer. Um, but what about learning? Because again, fixing on the CEO kind of dream, was like, look, a lot of pharma company go in big troubles because they have FDA warning letter, because the management team has no clue how hard it is to make a high quality medicine under you know, very clear regulation by FDA day in and day out. Um, and so, what, and again, looking at how do I not become the bridesmaid for a CEO job and I say, look, most of the CEOs never have that experience. So how do I mm. get that under my belt? Right. Uh, and the other thing I loved about manufacturing, which is, again, with a CEO job in line of sight, was I wanted to flex my uh, leading people muscle. Mm. Meaning, you know, most of the marketing jobs I was going to lead, you know, 5, 10, 15 people. The job I got from Lily was running a 200 people group right out of business school. And they were high school dropouts. Mm which, you know, it was not always easy. Uh, but it was such great learning for me. Right. And so that's why I, I, I chose uh, the new route uh, that was not necessarily sexy. Right. Just use the sexy route because I thought it was an important step to build a bigger... Uh, yeah, yeah. And track. as you said, not many other people would have had those global experiences yeah. and manufacturing experiences at that stage. Um, I do want to touch a little bit on, because um, I, I don't think you guys uh, talked about um, his, his background. So after you attended university here, you went to work for a company called Biomuro, which I, I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong, um, a French life sciences company in sales and marketing. And I think that's important because then you went back as CEO <laughs> not too long after. So 
what, what drew you in that direction? So that's out of undergrad before business school, right? Yeah, so actually I did undergrad in France, then I did grad school in chemical engineering in Minnesota, okay. in the US, and then I worked for Biomerio in See, Japan. See, he says it so much better. <laughs> it's much easier for me, trust me, uh, uh, in Japan. And the, so I explained why Japan before, and so I wanted to do Japan, and I wanted to do life science. Uh, and because I was French at the time, there was a French military service, that if you had been to grad school, you could basically not go to the army, but you could for 18 months work for almost nothing, literally, uh, for a French company, and you will get like a little stipend from the French government instead of going work for the army. Mm. And so it had to be a French company. So. Uh, I went to the French Chamber of Commerce in Paris. Again, I'm a very practical guy. I bought the directory of all the French companies in Japan. <laughs> and I wrote to all the CEOs of the Japanese subsidiaries uh, in life science. I think there are 10 or 15 of them, you know, from Sanofi to smaller companies. I think I got three people replying to oh me. Oh, my gosh. Or That's three tenacity. that replied to me. Uh, <laughs> I talked to the three of them. And I hit it off with one of the guys who was running Biomerio Japan. And so he proposed me an internship. So I went to work for free in Japan between <laughs> my French undergrad and, my, and the grad school in Minnesota. And I worked like crazy so that they would love me. They ended up loving me. And so he's like, you should not go to Minnesota. No, I'm going to Minnesota. <laughs> so they made me a job offer for the next summer. And so as soon as I got my master's in Minnesota, I got on a plane to Japan. And so I was in sales and marketing. I built basically one of the business units all over Asia in sales and marketing uh, for Biomerio. And then I came to HBS. And then you're right, uh, what was it, four years, five years after HBS, I ended up going back to run the company. Yeah, and I, I'd love to talk about that. Um, so just a little bit about your time here at HBS. Um, what did you learn from that experience? You and I talked a little mm -hmm. bit about um, getting the perspective of HBS as a lot of investment yeah. banker types. And Yeah, so I think there's a lot of learned. things that uh, really changed me with HBS. and. I sometimes joke with my wife that I wish I could just go back for two years. I'll pay five times the price, I don't care, just because it was so much fun. Uh, but I wish the iLab was here. I'd yeah. like to do over too. <laughs> and so the, the piece that was really, really important for me was first realizing how biased I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I'm trained as an engineer. I'm French, grew up in France. And so being in class with 80 smart people that have very diverse backgrounds, Looking, having read the same case as I read last night, and having very different perspective uh, from me uh, was a huge aha for me, and really drove me throughout my career after to pay a lot of attention to getting people that are very different from me around the table mm. to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a big one. The other one that helped me a lot, especially running a public company uh, for five years and uh, in the Moderna story, was understanding how people who work in the financial world think. Mm -hmm. So how analysts think, how investors think, portfolio managers think. Uh, that was very, very helpful uh, for me later running a public company. And then there's a lot of other things as well. Mm. Like great use at HBS. And, you know, and as you mentioned in the dot-com boom, you went the completely mm. unconventional mm -hmm. route and took a manufacturing job and uh, you know, as uh, I, when I was graduating from HBS, everyone took the investment banking consulting jobs, and I took a job in a startup. And it's very difficult to navigate your own course when it's um, it's being thrust upon you to go the other direction. So, how did you kind of stick to your guns and, and know that's what you wanted to do? Was it very intentional? And you just said, "I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get wined and dined by the McKinseys and Goldmans of the world." Yeah, uh, actually, it's funny because um, I actually liked it. Uh, because again, I was playing a long game, yeah. and so I was just thinking, geez, it's going to be so fun in five, ten years, <laughs> when people realize that I'm playing chess, not checkers, uh, and that <laughs> I, I'm going to be having a great, great life and a great career. And again, uh, I think I'm the type of person who believes in what I believe, and doesn't really care about what other people believe. Um, and that's one of the things that served me well in that experience, which is everybody wanted to go to dot coms. Some people, you know, consulting and banking as always. And, and it was great because nobody was going to Lily. So I got the CEO of Lily to interview me, to beg me to go to Lily. And they actually, even he asked me during the interview, by the way, why do you want a manufacturing job? <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting. You also mentioned that uh, you have an appreciation for history and geography and some of the more liberal art mm -hmm. um, 
background, uh, is it your education in, that led you to that, or did you always know that that would inform being a better CEO and having that diverse background? So it's interesting because being you know raised in France, you do a lot of you know history mm -hmm. uh, and uh, geography and so on. And I was also very bad at it. That's another thing my mom would tell you. I got a lot of C's and D's, uh, <laughs> literally, um, and. Um, it really hit me when I lived in Japan. Uh, and I was lucky because I was 22 years old when I you know, landed in Tokyo. Uh, and the great thing to go to such a diverse, uh, sorry, different culture, is you realize very quickly that you don't know how to operate because everything is so different uh, to be effective. Uh, and also you, I think, really discover your own culture and your own frameworks. Uh, because again, it's a bit like going to Mars, you know? It's just so different that you cannot escape it. Um, and so I started to spend a lot of time learning Japanese uh, because I think by learning the language, you learn a lot about the culture. Uh, it's even more true, I think, in Asia, especially countries that use kanji, because the way the kanjis are put together explain a lot about the values and mm. the culture. Mm. Um, and I started to learn a lot about geography, about uh, Japan, you know, history about Japan, and because as soon as I started the Japanese business, within 18 months, because we had great turnover, I think it was like three or four times the global average sales per sales rep that we had in Japan versus the rest of the company, that I was asked to start Korea and China and Australia. So I started to really discover all of Asia. And the more I was going to those countries, the more I was realizing that they're all very unique. And, and if you think that Korea and Japan are the same, or you know, people in Beijing or Shanghai or Hong Kong are the same, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> because you're going to make a lot of business mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so that then really st uh, uh, stayed with me you know, through the years to always try to understand where are people are coming from. Either on the short time frames, again, when you hire somebody, you know, what jobs have they done, uh, what uh, success they have had, what failures they have had, and how did that shape them. And then at the more macro level, you know, in terms of a company or a country, like when I got the BMI job as CEO, I think I interviewed 300 people for at least an hour, the top 300 people in the company, across the world, I spend at least an hour with each of them. And I, I, and I went with the same 20-ish questions to all of them, because mm. I wanted to really understand the, the organization. Yeah. I wanted to understand yeah. each individual, yeah. but I wanted to really get the company. And I wanted to have enough data point that there was no BS or too much you know, noise signal, but really what was really happening. Wow, that's incredible. You know, I'd love to talk a little bit about that, because you became CEO at the ripe old age of what, 33? 33. Um, after having been in sales and marketing a few years ago, so now you were the boss of a lot of people I'm yes. sure that you were working with or for. Um, how did it happen and what was that experience like? So how did that happen? That was actually not planned, <laughs> which is always the best. So I was at Lily really happy. I was at the, by then country manager at Lily. So I was running Belgium, so we're in Brussels. And I had just been offered the job by the CEO of Lily, the same guy, who still didn't know why I went to manufacturing <laughs> for two years. Uh, he's a great gentleman. Um, and he just gave me the job of running Lily Japan, which as you know, you know in the pharmaceutical market, is the second market in the world after the US. So it was a big, big job. Uh, I was very excited. Uh, my wife was actually to learn Japanese. Um, so we're already gearing to go to Japan. And maybe two, three weeks after he offered me the job, the chairman of Biomaria called me and he's like, uh, can we meet, you know, we just kept in contact like, you know, Christmas, mm -hmm. you know, year and card and so on, that's <laughs> it. And so we met in Belgium for lunch. I mean, he's French, so we meet at lunch. Uh, so we had a nice lunch. Uh, and literally, nice long lunch, I'm Yeah, sorry. and literally between <laughs> cheese and dessert, he's like, oh, by the way, we're looking for a new CEO. Uh, we have a few candidates, uh, but we have been talking and we'd love to have you uh, part of the discussions. Clearly, you are very young, so most probably you're not going to get the job, <laughs> which is what's great. Uh, and uh, would you be interested to talk? And I'm like, look, I'm heading to Japan. I love Lily. People have been very, very good to me. I'm not thinking of going. You know, I get a lot of calls from headhunters and going to Amgen or BMS or whatever. It's the same as Lily, so <laughs> I'm happy and I'm, I'm staying put. And um, but I'm like, look for a CEO job. Well, let's have a discussion. <laughs> and so when the process happened, you know, we talked for a few months, and they ended up making me a, a job offer. And so I was kind of uh, 
very happy for one or two evening and then really scared for a few months because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, geez, what did I do in my life? Uh, because one of the things I did, uh, you know, because I'm an engineer, I draw a lot. And I had to draw all the level of stretch that I had between what I really knew and what I thought I needed for the job. And I think there were like 10 layers of stretch. And I'm like, oh, geez, <laughs> is that the one job you should not have taken? Um, and so I took the job, uh, again, spending the first two months before working in the job uh, a few sleepless nights. Uh, and when I got in, I just got in and I just put my head down um, and, and just went for it. It's amazing. It, it must have been lots of interesting uh, yes. stories there. Um, so, okay, so let's kind of come full circle and get back to Moderna. So you're now CEO, you had your dream job, you're CEO of this amazing company. I believe you won lots of awards as a CEO. Um, why did you decide to leave this dream job, stable job, to go to a very early stage startup, as you mentioned, was just an idea at that yeah. point? So it was interesting. Uh, the, the, the true story is I was <laughs> thinking of leaving Biomario because I've been there for five years. It was a 6,000 people, you know, 5 billion market cap company, and truly global, you know present in 42 countries. I had, I had really done a lot of things with the team to kind of you know, accelerate the growth rate and improve the EBIT margin and all that, made a lot of acquisition. But there are two big acquisitions I tried to do that the board at the 11th hour kind of freaked out and didn't do. Two would have been wonderful. And after the second one, I kind of threw the towel. I'm like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> uh, and so I was interviewing for bigger jobs. And one day I got a a job I think I can talk about now because it's a long time ago. I got the CEO job of Hospira, um, which was kind of twice the size of Biomario in Chicago. And uh, I remember very vividly coming back on a Friday night with a job offer. And my wife saying, let's celebrate and so on. And I was you know, happy, but not kind of thrilled. Mm. And she's like, why are you not more happy? You, know, you wanted a new start, you know, you had a great job. And I'm like, look, uh, it's going to be the same all over again. Mm. What am I going to do? I'm going to spend the first three months in the plane, going around the world, talking to a lot of people, diagnostic the company, the executive team. Then I'm going to figure out do, who do I keep on the team. I'm going to have to fire people, replace people. <laughs> and then I'm going to have to agree with the board on a new strategy. And that's going to take another couple of months. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to spend again three months going around the world to talk to the entire employee base to explain the new strategy. And what are we going to do? We're going to buy companies. We're going to close sites. Close, you know, it's going to be all over, just with bigger numbers. And she was great. She was like, so what do you want to do? Because it's clearly not what you want to do. So what do you want to do? And i like, look, the only thing I've always dreamt of doing is starting something from scratch. That's the one thing that's always been on the back of my mind. Again, going back to the Steve Jobs books of Apple, you know, mm -hmm. 1.0. Mm -hmm. And she's like, look, this is the time to do it. And so because I knew all the VCs because I had bought a lot of companies when I was running Biomario. So we bought like 10 companies, so we must have looked at, I don't know, 50 companies you know, in five years. And so uh, I called all the VCs and they kept proposing stuff. There was the average biotech company, you know, the one product, go to Las Vegas, might not work, most probably. Uh, so I kept saying no to a lot of things. And one day, uh, Nuba Afayan called me, he's like, where are you? Because I was always, you know, in planes. <laughs> I'm like, actually, I'm in Boston, why? He's like, well, come to flagship tonight. and I'll, 6 p.m. I go to flagship and he shows me. This is flagship ventures in yeah. case you don't know. One of the VC, uh, <laughs> Candle Square. And so I arrive in his office, you know, it's dark outside, it must have been February or whatever. <laughs> and he showed me an experiment, one experiment with 10 mice. And he showed me the mouse that had been injected in the muscle, human hippo, and you can find human hippo in the blood. Meaning they turn the mouse into biotech factories because mouse <laughs> do not make human hippo, they make mouse hippo. And he showed me the data. I said, look at this, what do you think? And he already played me because he knew I was a biochemical engineer. I had made protein at the bench myself in grad school. I had made protein in big factories at Eli Lilly. I knew how hard it was and that most protein never become products uh, using you know, E. coli or true cells or whatever. And I'm like, this is not possible. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? It's like, this is one of those things that happen every day of a week from academia, you know, nice paper, you know, great, and you cannot replicate the data. So I'm like, thank you very much for wasting my evening. I'm going to go home, have dinner with my wife and kids now. And he's like, uh, Stefan, don't go now. Just for our friendship, you will have a lot of time to check the data. Assume for five minutes this is for real. You will have all the time you want to go check yeah. the data. And we can reproduce it, you know, on labs, but just for five minutes as a friend, 
just uh, play with me and tell me if this is true. I assume it's true. What would that mean? And we spend an hour going crazy. You know, if it was going to work for one, it was going to work for many. Most of the protein in your body is, you know, we have 22,000 protein in your bodies. Two thirds are undruggable, meaning you cannot make a drug for them because they are inside your cell and you cannot get a recombinant protein inside your cells. So like, well, we can do any protein. Most, pro most probably all the protein that are tried to be made by pharma that didn't work because of glycosylation pattern or other technical reasons because they were made in bacteria cells or cho. If you make them in vivo in the same body with the same machinery that's making them every day of the week when you're healthy, most probably they should work. Then we talk about IP and it's like, what do you think of IP? You're just messing up with me. <laughs> so, well, IP, if you think about it, the, vial, the drug in the vial is on the protein. So from a composition of matter IP standpoint, it's irrelevant because the drug in the vial is going to be a messenger RNA. So all the patents from the old biotech industry most probably is useless, meaning you can go out doing anything you want. And we just kept going and going and going. And then we're like, yeah, it's going to be the same manufacturing process. So no more capital at risk. You know, in biotech, the big issue is very early on because it takes, you know, three to five years, depending on the type of plant and the size you're going to build to get it ready uh, for launch. You need to make those decisions very early on when you have very little data and most of the time things you know, flunk in the clinic. And so here this, this risk is gone. Why? Because you make you know, mouse EPO, mRNA, human EPO, human insulin, it's all the same process. So we kept going like this and, and then it's like it was very good. It's like, okay, well, have a nice evening. <laughs> and so I left and I remember crossing the Longfellow Bridge, walking and going home and I was kind of almost half drunk, you know, <laughs> because my brain was just racing. I'm like, geez, geez. And I didn't sleep for a few nights just thinking about the possibility. And so what I did, I took... Uh, two days of holiday from Biomaria, because public <laughs> company, so you want to do things very well. <laughs> and I went into the lab to see for myself and talk to the technicians. And everything I checked seems okay. Uh, and I spoke with a few of the founders, like Bob Langer and Jack Sotka, who is Nobel Prize of Medicine and so on. And everybody told me, yeah, this might be you know, a, a, a thing in the kingdom of biology that we have not seen before, mm. that we might have found a way to do it. And so, so then I spent agonizing, you know, do I do, I do it or do I not do it? And, and two things made me decide at the end. One was, if it was going to work, and I would have said no, because they're going to find a CEO, of course. They're not going to stay on such a cool idea, and, and they're going to find a lot of CEOs who want to do it. So if I say no, and this works, I'm going to hate myself the rest of my life. Right, right. Every day I'm going to go shaving in the mirror, and I'm going to be... <laughs> <laughs> and so that was one thing. Uh, and then my wife uh, one day says something interesting, because we always make our big career life decision, usually with a bottle of wine you know, in a bar somewhere. <laughs> uh, and it's a long night, usually. And, uh, and she says, you have to do it. And she, you know, she's a photographer. She doesn't really understand science. Uh, but she said, look, uh, this could change the world. This could have such a huge impact on patients from what you described. The team is you know, top-notch, you know, world-class scientists, you know, funding, and so on. And you have to do it because you are so stubborn, you will go through brick walls. And this has to, be, this has to work, so you have to go to make it work. And I'm like, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and so between those two different, very different yeah. facets, uh, I decided to make the plunge. And actually, when you think about it, at the end of the day, there was no risk because, you know, with a career I had built before, if it was not going to work, most probably it was going to be because of science. Uh, and I will find another job, either small or big companies. So kind of what also made me at peace with the whole decision at the end, I'm like, actually, there's no risk. So just go for it, do, give it your best shot, and we'll see you know, where we're on the other side of that bridge in a few years from now. Yeah, yeah, you could not do it. Yeah, correct. Um, so, okay, so you've got this unbelievably re revolutionary vision that you have to achieve. How do you build a company that enables you to do that? And you know, something we talk about a lot here is this one Harvard cross-disciplinary approach to entrepreneurship and that diversity of experiences and thought, you know, great outcomes occur. Yeah. Talk about diversity in your organization and the culture that you're building and how do you achieve this vision? So, so there are a few things. Um, I think the first thing is really people. 
I mean, it's obviously business is about people, people, people. You get great people, you get a great business. You get average people, you get an average business at best. And you get bad people, you get an awful business. <laughs> uh, so getting great people and then um, I, clearly thinking big. I mean, from day one, I mean, the question we ask ourselves, we never said publicly, but was if Genentech had known in the early days of Genentech that they were starting the recombinant revolution, how would they have built the company so they owned the entire space? Mm -hmm. So there was no Amgen, there was no Genzyme, there was a huge Genentech. So we asked ourselves this question uh, in the early days. And what we did a lot, which I really advise every entrepreneur to do, is imagine a kind of huge success <coughs> and then play the movie backwards many times, you know, in terms of what must happen so if you are intellectually honest, this outcome is possible. Not that it will happen, because of course there's 50 million risk. But what needs to happen when so that this crazy great outcome has a chance to happen, that it's possible. And so we spend a lot of time, a lot of evenings, um, really brainstorming on that. The piece that was very clear to me in the early days uh, was that I needed to find a big corporate partner with, because I knew I needed a lot of money. The thing that was very clear to me, where I think I was not naive coming from the big company world, I knew on sweat equity, I could not build the crazy big Moderna was going to dominate and be the leading company in the field of mRNA. I think it was just impossible. I thought it was naive. And so I thought I need a partner. And when you, you go and you look at the industry, if you think about it, you know, Genentech had a partner. Everybody thinks it's Roche because Roche ended up buying Genentech, but it was Lilly. The first product that Genentech did was human insulin and human growth hormone for Eli Lilly. Uh, because Lily had those products coming from animals. There was no recombinant product, of course, at the time. And so G Genentech had Lily. Amgen had j, j Again, everybody has forgotten now, but Epo outside the US was a product that was licensed to j, &J. So with a, with a partner, you get validation, which financial investors love, because it de-risk the proposition. You buy capabilities, or you get access to capabilities. And of course, to what you need the most is money. Uh, and so uh, I always ask myself in the first months as we are trying to figure out where do we start this you know, crazy company, but we have to start somewhere. I, again, playing the movie backward from getting a deal done, I'm like, why do I need? And the three things I thought I needed was I need two drugs in monkeys. Why monkeys? Because again, coming from big pharma, I'm like mice and rat are nice and cute, but useless. Nobody in the business believes mouse and rat data, you need monkey data. So I say, I need two drug in monkey, why two? Because if I say I'm gonna have a great platform and I can only show one, it looks a bit bizarre. <laughs> so we're gonna go for two. So two drugs in monkey, so I put a small team of having four people just doing that. Uh, and then the second thing I said, again, with my former experience, I need to run a massive rat talk study. Like crazy dosage, you know, different schedule of frequency of injection. That's something that, again, the head of R&D of Big Pharma will look at and say, this is for real. So I had another small team of three or four people. Their only job was to be able to prepare and then run a massive uh, rat talk study. And the third group uh, was about, you need to prove to other people who are not going to believe you that this is really a platform. So the goal I set to the to a team of four people were shaking when I told them the, the, the <laughs> mandate was, I want in six months 100 different human protein, and I pick 100, of course, out of thin air, 100 <laughs> human protein in mouse. So that team went, and, they, and we, so we made the list together, and I said, this is what you have to make, and you have six months. And so they went and making a little append of two because the robots you saw of course, none of that existed uh, when we had $3 million in the bank and nine people in the company. And so they went in little, and they made, uh, and actually, I think it cracked it. One of the things I learned also uh, in my biomarried days, almost by accident, uh, which is if you set very clear, very simple goals, mm -hmm. and in every meeting you go as a CEO, you only ask those one, two, or max three questions. So I always have a focused team. So I can only ask them one question. Mm -hmm. And the whole meeting is always that. When I came to Biomario, one of the things I did, which I think is a, is a good learning, I did it almost intuitively. 
but it was my biggest aha as the CEO of Biomario, is in our core business, we had 30% market share through zero. And we were number one head to head with Beckton Dickinson. And one year BD was number one because the dollar was stronger and they were stronger in the US. One year Biomario was number one because the euro was stronger. <laughs> but any time for like 15 years, 30% market share, plus or minus 1% every year. And when I look at the company strategy, I went to my first board meeting and I told the board and before the management team, in five years, we're going to have 40, 40% market share. Um, and nobody believed this. Why? Because for 15 years, market share was flat. And I said, we're going to do it by pushing harder current product, doing better launches, putting more money in R&D and buying companies that have small market share just to consolidate the cats and dogs of the industry. And we can just plug that into the global commercial network and we should make the numbers. Everybody was terrified. And to make matters worse, the first time I went to see Wall Street, it, as part of my strategic plan, I told the street, we're going to get 40% market share in five years <laughs> in our core business. And the stock price went up, I think, 10% that day. Uh, everybody was happy about that. Uh, but then everybody in the company was terrified. Right. You have to actually and, and some of them will ask me, how are you going to do it? I say, I have no idea, but you guys are going to tell me. Yeah. And I would go to every meeting across the world in R&D, in sales, in production, I would only ask one question. How we get to 40% market share? And you fast forward the story, we go to 42% market share in three years. And it's not me, it's them. It's my team across the world, we did it. But mm -hmm. the piece I learned from that is if you set a very simple goal that you can explain to a sixth grader, you know, in terms of how simple it is, and something that's very measurable, and I will go and every quarter, We'll measure our market share and we'll really be, try to assess where we're making progress, mm -hmm. where we're not making progress. And so I reuse that tool at Moderna, which is one of the things we do now is in one of our big, like 10 year goal, is 100 drugs in a clinic. Mm -hmm. And I tell my team, and every time I hire somebody new coming from Big Pharma, they're like, this is impossible. <laughs> uh, and I have a bet with Steven, who is the president of a company and really my partner in building Moderna. I have a bet with him that we're going to do better. <laughs> and I told him, I have no idea how we're going to do it. I bet there's wine involved in it. There's <laughs> <laughs> always wine or beer involved. Uh, but I'm convinced that by being so clear about everything we do, about what robot do we buy, you know, what talent uh, do we hire, how do we think about capital allocation, everything is guided by this very simple metric, 100 drug in a clinic mm. in 10 years. Yeah. And I think this is a, a piece that really served us well in the early days, those three very simple objectives. And that's the only thing we're doing. I will go to people and I will only talk about those three things. And we delivered on those three things uh, in a very significant way. And so when we raise uh, money privately, because of this data set, we were able to have a huge step up in the first series round of the company. Uh, and then we did the AstraZeneca deal, which you know, brought $240 million up front technology access fee, no stock, not one share, um, which really, I mean, transformed the company because we went from $20 million in the bank to $260 million in the bank overnight. And then we started scaling. And the crazy dream of a company that could really own the messenger on this space now became possible. Amazing. And, you know, that's incredible advice, I think, for any entrepreneur at any stage of development and be so singularly focused on something very measurable. So everyone in the company is marching towards that same goal. Um, so before we break for questions, I'd, I'd be really interested in um, any advice you have for first time entrepreneurs. And as we build out the life lab and uh, filling it with life science ventures, um, any advice that you would give to first time entrepreneurs going into either life sciences or, or in general? Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> what to do, what not to do? <laughs> so. I will go back to the basics, which is the people, which is make sure the people you get with you, either co-founders or first employees or part-time consultants or whatever, uh, make sure you pick the right people. I mean, it's, it's a very obvious you know, piece of advice, uh, but I've seen companies being destroyed by the founding teams not getting along full time, mm -hmm. um, by the founding teams not being aligned on what was really the goal, 
you know, easy to build a great company and you are already into this for 20 years and you're going to do whatever it takes. Easy to sell the company in two or three years. You know, uh, I think this is really, really important. It's one of the things I feel very blessed about Steven, again, who is really my partner in building the company, and Nubar uh, Afayan, who is the, the CEO of flagship, still the largest shareholder and the chairman of the company, is we are extremely aligned. We can, you, there's no space between any of us on the values in our appetite for risk, in our appetite for breaking things and learning by making mistakes. Uh, and this is, I think, the most valuable because everything else ends up being a detail. You can always fix stuff, you can change stuff because it's end up being on the margin. So I really think making sure that you are very clear what you want to build, how you want to build it, um, and why you want to build it. Uh, because I, I think there can be a lot of games played in terms of making the hard decisions if you are not very aligned on why you are doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no good or bad answer. I mean, all the answers are, are good answers for the people because everybody is different. But I think they are very clear because a company is not a straight line. A company is, it goes like this, you know? And, and you can ask my team and my wife in the early days. I mean, she thought I was going to become bipolar because I would <laughs> walk home one week. I would be, you know, tap dancing home. We're going to change the world. It's going to be the biggest company in the world, literally, <laughs> because the potential is just crazy. And I would come two weeks after and I'm like, this is never going to work. <laughs> this is never going to work. And I mean, the yo-yos are not, are not as amplified as they used to be. Uh, because we have so much more money in the bank, we have great people, we've learned so much about the science, and we're in a clinic now, so it's not as intense and as crazy, but those rides are, are real. And I think the more disruptive is your technology or your business model, the more I think you have to be ready with that core team mm -hmm. about who you really are and what enterprise you really want to build, because the yo-yos are gonna be crazy. And you want to make sure that at the time where you need cohesion, that you don't have, you know, misalignment because that's where you're going to lose a lot of energy and maybe you're going to lose the company. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's great advice. Um, and we talk a lot about that here too. We, Alice, I, and other folks here do a lot of therapy sessions with co-founders to make sure that they are aligned and it doesn't always start off that way. Um, okay, I don't know how we're doing for time. You want to turn it over to yeah. some questions? Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I Thank appreciate you. it. Well, before I get into questions, I, can you hear me? Before I get into questions, if you can join me in thanking um, Stefan and Jody for, you know, you did a great for a non-scientist, Jody. So I have <laughs> to say. Um, and thank you everyone for tweeting questions. We actually have a really interesting mix of both uh, scientific questions and business related questions. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge who Jonathan Freelander, who tweeted, is he here? Oh, well, I'm not sure where he went, but um, his first question. Up to the question. <laughs> um, well, one of the big challenges for like RNA therapies is delivery. So he was wondering, like, does it need to be adapted for the various cell types and how hard is this problem? And uh, so yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> uh, so the cool thing about messenger RNA versus over nucleotide technology, so RNA or gene therapy and so on, is that we have so many rooms for maneuver. So we do vaccines today. Vaccines we inject intramuscular, <coughs> and we have a muscle cells making the antigen. That's gonna make your body make the antibody to protect you. We do intradermal, and we go uh, mess up with your immune system, just under your skin. And they are not happy when they see this mRNA stuff, and they have they have to make you know the proteins. Um, there are some organ system like the liver that the whole industry is know how to go to the liver, and. The cool thing for us is there are more than 80, 80 rare disease which origin is a protein mm. misfolding or mass function inside the liver cell, even if the side effects are in the brain or somewhere else. And so think about it, already 80 drugs that you can just mm. go at it. Um, we are also working in cancer now, so we go directly inject into tumor, which is very easy to do clinically um, because people do biopsy every day of the week. And so if you think about it, it's just doing <laughs> thing the other way around. Instead of taking a sample from a tumor, you just s stick something into a tumor. And when you, make, when you get some very nasty messenger RNA making very nasty protein inside tumor cells, tumor cells don't like it so much. So it works really well. Mm -hmm. So we have things like this that is kind of a, the starting base of a company. So 
again, being very practical, we started by saying, okay, where can we get the mRNA to work now so that we can raise money to invest in the science to make it work in other system. So we are working now as we speak on the brain, we're working on the lung, we're working on the eye. Uh, so we're using, if you want, it's always how do you start the pump? Mm -hmm. Because it's all about investing in the science, but for investing in the science, you need money. So it's, it's kind of what's the path that you have to figure out that you're going to use to build a company? Yeah, I, I think I, I work with a lot of scientists, and we have a lot of really lofty goals in science. Yeah. But I think part of the, the challenge and the um, strategy is to figure out what are those intermediate steps that can get you to that end goal. Yeah. And it's, like, it's not to say you give up on that big dream, but it's like, what are the intermediate steps? Yeah, and I think that's a very important point because and I think that's a thing that not being a scientist, but being an engineer, business guy was a big help in that process which is because I so cared about making great drugs for patients for very, very tough diseases, I know my only chance to get there is if I do the first steps. Because if I only shoot for you know, the home run right away and we miss it, I'll be out of money, I'll be dead. So I will have failed everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next question is more about the business. Is how does, oh, this is from Phoebe Hong. Um, how does Moderna's goals overlap with those other biotech disruptors? So I think specifically talking about CRISPR, like Editas and Caribou. Yeah, so uh, we love gene editing. So number one, just to make a statement, um, we are using gene editing every day of the week uh, as a research tool, because we think it's a very cool way to create animal models, especially in our case, you, know, you go knock down some genes, and then you come with an mRNA very quickly. Uh, it's much faster than doing the old way. Uh, we see gene editing as an important technology uh, for the long term. And when I mean long term, I mean really long term. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but there are very few diseases that I can think of that I'll be comfortable getting my kids with a technology that's going to cut their gene forever. Mm. Uh, so again, I think it's a wonderful scientific breakthrough that people are using around the world uh, in a massive way already today. I think it's going to have therapeutic application, there is no doubt. Uh, when you see how regulatory agencies are with us, where we can prove the mRNA is gone in 48 hours, mm. it's gone. And we've done that with academic labs, so it's not even my data, it's data from academic labs that we have uh, collaborated with. To the whole idea that you can go cut somebody's gene forever in key organs. So I think it's going to really have to start with disease that cannot be done using other technology mm -hmm. and with a, a crazy boatload of clinic, uh, preclinical data and then going very slowly into the clinic. Uh, and so given a lot of things that can be done also with messenger RNA, I think for, for quite some time uh, we're going to have a, a good place. Have a good run. Uh, so one of the questions, you kind of addressed this, it was about the undruggable, like being able to create solutions for undruggable um, diseases. Uh, they, Shepherd Bio, oh, it's one of our uh, launch lab startups. Uh, they were wondering, can you talk more about the ability to treat these undruggable? Um, and the example he gave was like those links to transcription factors. Yeah, so again, the beauty of a messenger RNA like over nucleotide technology is the ability to get inside the cell. And once you're inside the cell, you can make any protein you want. You can make a human protein, but you can make also an antibody. So you can go bind to a pathway and just take something down. So a lot of people think about mRNA only at activating, you know, turning things on, but we can turn something down as well. And we can, because we can mix different mRNA in the same dose, we can also knock a pathway down here and up here and do like crazy cool biology with four or five mRNA in a the, in the single dose. So, 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 so that's really a space that we think is really interesting uh, because of a lot of medical needs that exist out there. And the fact that you cannot go with recombinant, that some of those things you cannot even drug with a small molecule. Um, and so that's the space that we like to play with. Because as Bob Langer, you know, uh, who is a fantastic serial entrepreneur and a professor from MIT, I'm sure most people know Langer, uh, always told me, Stefan, you have to figure out where we have an unfair competitive advantage. <laughs> so don't try to do something better than everybody else that they do. Do something that nobody else can do. So we love that space, and we love to play in that space. 
Um, I think I'll take two more questions. Uh, one is, how, is it, how does the tech, oh, this is from Craig McHenry. How does the technology behind Moderna products affect the potential for competition? I'm not actually sure I understand the question. <laughs> so if you're in the room, if you want to elaborate. Biosimilar technology, how, how do you foresee competition coming in behind you? Yeah, so um, the cool thing about Moderna is because we are, we are so young. I mean, we are filing IP like you would not believe. Uh, I think we are up to 450 patent families. Some of them are 10,000 pages of data for one family, all with data in mammal system, so in vivo, so we can have mammal claims in the claims we filed to the USPTO. Um, but the thing that excites me the most is because, given nobody has really done messenger RNA, uh, we are going through a very steep S curve of learning and improving the technology. We have already improved the technology uh, a thousand fold in four years. So a thousand time, not 10 or 20%, a thousand time. That's three logs. Uh, and this year, the team is going to give us another log. And if I had to bet, uh, I'm not speaking with hard data, but just because of what I see every day, I'd be shocked if we don't get another thousand fold. And so the patents we are filing now make some of the early patents irrelevant. Hmm. So we're starting to prune the uh, IP portfolio and let some of the early patents go into public domain. Because sometimes we even look at it and say, oh, that was really naive and stupid. <laughs> we say, let's forget this one. So, so we are already betting on the fact that like any technology that mankind has touched, it has always gone through this S-shaped curve you know, in, in a 10 to 20 year time frame. And the main trial we had since day one we're not going to bet on the fact we are smarter, because most probably we are not. We're going to bet on the fact that we are going to learn faster. So again, all the robots and IT you saw is part of enabling that vision, which is how do you go from a, a cool idea from a scientist to animal data in monkeys. And we have that cycle now nailed down to two, maybe three months max, where you go from an idea, you make the messenger RNA, and if you want 20 different things to try 20 different ideas in parallel in the same experiments, we have done that. So we have done studies in monkeys with 20 arms. That's just how nuts we are. 20 arms to learn biology in parallel, not in series. Uh, and then go, be able to go, either go into the clinic if we like it, or go back to the drawing board based on the learning to iterate fast. So we. I always drive people crazy because as we look at how do we improve this crazy research engine that we built, I push the team for saving one day. And when they are new to the company, they always challenge me, Stefan, one day, really? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, really, because I'm thinking 20 years. So if a cycle of learning is two to three months, every day you save me on every cycle is going to be weeks and weeks on the back end of winning the game. And that's really the game we are playing. And so that's why I go back to really being so clear about the company you are building, because you need to make those decisions and those trade-offs. Because there's no you know, free cake. Uh, you have to really make those trade-offs and decide who am I and who am I not, and stick to your guns. Of course, if you realize on halfway you made a big mistake, you have to <laughs> change uh, or you're going to die. Uh, but if you think that the data support your business hypothesis. You need to keep pushing hard and putting your head down and do the work. Okay, the last question um, is about the, I guess, the spin-out ventures yeah. that are in Moderna. So uh, Phoebe is actually wondering, like, what's the reasoning behind the business model of having multiple ventures? So it's a great question. So the truth is we never started thinking we're going to do that. Uh, we're not that smart. Um, it happened because... Uh, after we signed the AZ deal, so as I said, you know, we woke up with a lot of money, uh, and we decided to scale the company in an incredible way. So we went, so it took us a kind of two years to hire 20 people and go slowly because we didn't have money and we were very careful on the spend and so on. And then we woke up and it's like, okay, now it's no, full speed. <laughs> um, and we went from 20 people to 100 people in like six months. Mm. So the company it was just it was crazy. Um, and at that time, I started to have a bad feeling. Um, and that was because the team 
I mean, people in the team were, would either focus on the technology, how to get the new formulation, how to get the new chemistry, the new process, or they would focus on the drugs. And I was having a bad feeling because I'm like, if people, because of their own biases, and again, everybody's biased starting with me, are going to either focus on drugs or on technology, the way we're organized today, which is one company doing everything, is going to be a great recipe for failure because we're going to end up being average at everything. Mm -hmm. And so we spent quite some time with the team and with the board thinking about, geez, how do you deal with that? You know, again, the idea of focus, uh, the idea of um, incentivizing people for huge upside when they win. Um, and so we did the usual Moderna thing, which is we play the movie, and then we play the movie backward. It's so, okay, if we're gonna have you know, 50 drugs, 100 drugs in the clinic, what must have happened? And what became clear to us is that at some stage in the evolution of a company, we needed to keep the teams to a workable size because the big pharma experiment show you cannot do true innovation you know, in, in, in big, big organization. You can do great development or manufacturing or commercial in big organization. We don't think you can do great true innovation with more than 20, 30, 40 people. And so, so as part of that process, we realized that at some stage, we need to have smaller units that were gonna to start to exist. And so we just say, why wait? Let's just buy the bullet now and do it right. And so let's start those teams. And so we said, Moderna is gonna not making drug uh, and just focus on technology. So the way we think about it is like, uh, we want to be the best messenger RNA operating system company. Mm -hmm. And we want to enable a lot of drugs. Right. And the model we have is like those guys, is either we're gonna develop some apps ourselves, you know, think email, mm -hmm. you know, uh, messaging or whatever. And other apps, other drugs are gonna be made by other people. But what we want is the best mRNA OS, and not best by 20% by 10x. Like, the, we learn a lot from the tech world, you know, and we say we want to be better than the number two in the business by 10x. And so the Moderna team, under the leadership of Steven, who runs that whole uh, operating system, that's all they do. They dreams, they have nightmares about the new formulation, the new chemistry, the process that's not working, that they have to reinvent again. And then you have those ventures, which are by, more than therapeutic area is by application of a technology. Because we want to learn. It's all about learning. When you really understand that about us, you understand a lot of our decision. We want to learn faster than anybody. So the Valera team, what they do, they do infectious disease vaccine, period. The Onkaido team, they do oncology, they do immuno-oncology. They don't do anything else in oncology. To tell you how obsessed we are by this focus strategy, we have another venture in oncology, it's called Caperna. They do personalized cancer vaccine, where the idea is we take your sequence from your tumor, we sequence it, we find 10 to 20 neoantigens on the surface of your tumor that are specific to your cancer, and within a month turnaround time, we're gonna ship to the clinical trial site and down the road to the clinic treating you, a vaccine made for you in a month. Uh, and because we realize our vaccine have a very strong T cell response, very strong CD8, CD4s, uh, meaning that we think we can teach your immune system how to very specifically spot your tumor, get very upset <laughs> with your tumor, and basically go eat, chew your tumor. And so, they just show you how crazy we are about this focus, where the Onkaido guys are making traditional immuno-onc drugs, and the Caperna guys are making oncology vaccine, and they are, of course, talking together. The two teams are literally next to each other, so there's a lot of collaboration, while there's a lot of focus at the same time. You guys have been more than inspired and will immediately apply to the Life Lab that's coming again, fall 2016. But if you can join me in thanking again Stefan and Jody for a great conversation. Thank you. Uh, this is just one of many in our series. We're starting this. So uh, we, you will get an email asking uh, you know, what you liked, what we can do in, better in the future. But also in two weeks, we have the next person in our series, uh, which is Black Thought. He's a lead, lead singer of The Roots. Um, he's really involved in entrepreneurship in the arts. But um, yeah, join us then. You'll get an email as well about that. 
But I think Stefan's going to stop for, I mean, join, stay for a little while. So I'm sure there's going to be a mash yeah. rush. So fair warning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.